Thank you, Cam Ming, and thank you for organizing this conference. It's great to see so many of you. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dave, in part because there are so many really genuinely wonderful things one can say about Dave. Um, you can read Dave's uh, information, Vita, uh, profile on, online. And so, uh, you know, it includes things such as uh, his contributions to the profession through serving as editor of the RFS and uh, president of the FMA. But I would like to introduce Dave by making three observations. The first is that uh, one reason this is a pleasure is that I consider Dave a friend. However, I believe that in that I am not alone in that I think Dave has a large number of friends throughout the profession. He must be uh, the most admired and congenial person in finance. My second observation is about Dave's uh, research, which reaches into, into seemingly all areas of corporate finance. I mean, just if you think of, of, of the areas he has touched, they include corporate diversification, dividend payments, share purchases, and more recently, corporate financial policies. Um, this is research in its most basic, fundamental, and purest sense, uh, the exploration of data, the establishment of new facts, and importantly, uh, the, uh, the provision of an, a theoretical framework with which to make sense of these facts and the data. There are several things that we now take as accepted in the canon of our field, that come from Dave's papers, and I thought I would mention just a couple of them. I have a long list here, but I'll stop partway through. Managerial agency costs help explain much corporate diversification. Not controversial. Uh, we teach this in our MBA classes. Uh, well, this comes from Dave's work. His, he's got a, his 1997 uh, JF and 2002 JF papers with Diane Dennis, um, Atulia Seren, Kevin Yost, or forced CEO resignations are associated with performance improvements. Notice these are my pithy attempts to take big insights and put them into the, the snippets that are just accepted parts of our field. This comes from Dave's uh, 1995 JF paper, with Diane Dennis. Uh, ownership structure is a key factor in driving changes in corporate boards and top executive turnover. Again, two uh, JFE papers, one in 1997, one in 1999 with Diane Dennis, Atelia Sarin. Um, here's one more. Firms hold cash to avoid investment constraints and economize on cost of external financing. Now, these are my words to try to summarize this. Um, uh, uh, this this is, I think, a, a broader set of insights uh, which Dave's papers help establish, including an RFS paper and a JFE, a recent JFE paper of Lance Bargeron and Ken Lane. My third observation. You might have noticed that some of these papers are with Dave's wife, Diane Dennis. Um, I, it turns out that I asked Diane for material for this introduction, and Diane provided this story. And this is my third observation. <laughs> this can it only turns be bad. Out Dave and Diane <laughs> met at the University of Michigan when they were PhD students, but it turns out that Dave almost did not make it to the University of Michigan. He had been he had not been accepted, and was about to uh, attend a PhD program at another Big Ten university when apparently at the last minute he got a call and was accepted into Michigan's program. He decided he'd take that offer. He went to Michigan, met Diane, and embarked on a collaboration that has been fruitful for all of us, um, thereby, I think, also illustrating that serendipity does, in fact, sometimes happen. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Dave Dennis. <laughs> Thanks, John. Let's see, do we need to find my present? You got to. Well, 
Thanks. Thanks, John, very much for the introduction. As soon as you mentioned uh, talking to Diane, I, I started to break out in a sweat. <laughs> but that worked out all right. I appreciate it. Very, very generous comments. And uh, I want to offer my, my thanks also to, to Cam Ming and, and Hunkin School and and uh, JCF for, for putting all this together and, and especially for inviting me to be part of it. It's very, it's very much an honor to be, to be up here and um, to actually have a teleprompter in front of me. I mean, that's a big deal. <laughs> um, um, you know, as, as, as John mentioned, um, I've dabbled in a lot of different areas so in research and in, in corporate finance. And, and part of the, the title of this conference, I've, I've certainly dabbled in with the impact of ownership structure, what, what drives ownership structure, and what are the consequences of, of, of ownership structure. But I have not dabbled in the second half of this, which is sustainability policy. So it's been kind of interesting for me to – to, to step back and, and think about how these two things might be related in, in some ways. And that's, that's going to be kind of what I talk about uh, this morning. Um, but before I get there, I, I you know, it, it occurred to me in, in, in thinking about all of this that, you know, it, the, the starting point for what I'm going to talk about, and I think probably is true for virtually everybody in this room, is just to sort of accept the fact that there is this, increased attention on, on uh, corporate socially responsible policies and an increased demand for that today. And we just sort of accept that to be true. And I think it's unquestionably true uh, at this point. But we don't tend to ask why that is the case uh, very often, nor am I going to even attempt to answer why that is. But it, it did lead me to speculate on, on, on a couple of reasons for, for why that might be might be true, because it's certainly the case that Social concerns have been around forever, and, and corporations have been pushed for a long time to, to think about these things and maybe make them part of the objective function, and nothing's been in the way of, of that happening. But it's not really till the last five, ten years that I think we've seen the, the magnitude of this attention being, being placed on, on uh, thinking about these social concerns within the organizational structure of, of, of the corporation. So, so, so why is that the case? I don't have the answer to that, but you know, a couple of things that, that, that came to mind is that it's, it's possible that the social concerns may have increased in magnitude in recent years. As, as companies have become more complex, more global, maybe the social concerns themselves are larger. And you can think of climate change perhaps as a as a prototypical example of, of, of that sort of thing that might that might increase the magnitude of the concerns themselves. Um, second possibility is that, well, maybe the concerns themselves are not really that different from before, but individual preferences have changed over time so that various stakeholders uh, are just more sensitive to those concerns than, than they were before. Right. Or a third possibility is that, well, maybe a lot of these concerns really take the form of externalities that, as economists, we would think, well, these are, these are things that, that institutions like government bodies should be addressing, but we have diminished faith in the ability of those institutions to, to, to address those things. And as a result, there's now increased demand for them to be addressed within the organizational structure of, of the corporation. All these are possibilities. They're not mutually exclusive. I don't know which one is is really driving it. Maybe there's others that are that are more important than this. But but I think it's worth actually thinking about. And some of you may be addressing this over the course of the next couple of days, uh, in the context of of your talks. But I'm going to talk about something that I think is a little bit more manageable from my from my standpoint, a much more uh, narrow concern. Uh, which is whether this increased demand or attention on CSR requires us to rethink this whole idea of, of share, shareholder primacy in, in the corporate objective function. Now, I've just taken a, a, a quotation from the call for papers for this conference that in a way kind of implies, well, that we're already moving along this path 
towards rethinking this 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 paradigm. And the call for papers just sort of tells us that, you know, going all the way back to Friedman, we've had this idea of of shareholder primacy that we can justify under certain conditions, um, but those conditions don't actually exist in the real world. And so therefore, we sort of started gradually shifting towards a, a stakeholder primacy sort of viewpoint of the, of, of the corporate objective function. Right, that's sort of what I want to take a little bit deeper dive into thinking about uh, as to whether that, that's really uh, required in this particular case of CSR demand. And, and basically where I'm going with this is say my short answer is no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think that we really need to rethink that, that objective function. And it's sort of based on, on three primary observations. Right? One is that this increase in focus on CSR is really distinct from the factors that drove us towards shareholder primacy in the first place. So all those factors that led to shareholder primacy as sort of being an endogenous uh, outcome of, the, of, of organizational structure all those factors are still there, and in fact, maybe even exacerbated if we throw on top of the traditional factors some increase in demand for, for CSR. So if we thought shareholder primacy was a reasonable equilibrium before, I think it's probably still the case. Right now, of course, that, that doesn't mean that if we have increased demand for, for CSR, that demand is not being met. In fact, I'm going to argue that there's lots of market forces that are out there that will push this CSR demand to be met within the confines of a shareholder primacy sort of a, 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 of objective function. And then third, that if we were to shift away from that, right, we're likely to generate some additional costs, both in the form of traditional contracting costs and, and, agency, and agency problems that, at least to me, seem like they're likely to exceed uh, the benefits of that we would get from from moving towards a more stakeholder orientation. Right. So that that's kind of uh, where I'm going to be going with this over over the next several minutes. So how how am I going to get there? I think what I'd like to do is sort of go back to the basics. And, and in a lot of ways, what I'm talking about is is really uh, my evolution of thinking about it in the first place. This is the kind of the way. I have to think about all problems this is to make them as simple as I possibly can uh, and then try to think about it, if anything's different. So I think it's worthwhile to think about how we got to shareholder privacy in the first place as equilibrium organizational type of structure. I, and then ask if, if we have this increase in demand for, for CSR, right, should that change anything? Right? How and how should it, should that change? Right, third, what might be some costs of deviating from this idea of, of shareholder primacy? And then finally, assuming Kamming doesn't cut me off due to time, which I'll, I'll try to be efficient, um, I think there's some implications of, of the, the framework that I'm going to talk about for, for conducting research in, in this area. And, and I think I should point out at this point um, that I feel like a lot of what I'm going to talk about are issues that others have, have, have talked a lot about uh, already in the, in the past. John's certainly one of them. Diane's one of them. They've, they've addressed this issue of the corporate objective function. And I view sort of what I'm talking about is, is, is collecting the thoughts from a lot of different people in a way that makes sense to me and applying them in this, in the context of this very specific question of increased CSR demand and how that potentially impacts the, the objective function. Okay, so let me go back to, to, to the starting point. For me, the starting point is, is kind of the contracting framework that at least when I first learned it was advocated by authors like Jensen and Mechley Fama and Jensen and various combinations of those authors over the years where they, they kind of view the firm as a legal fiction in the sense that it is this nexus of contracts among customers and the various factors of production, suppliers of labor, suppliers of capital, and, and so on. Right. And if you view the firm in that way, how the firm is ultimately structured as an organization is really an endogenous solution to a problem of, of trying to supply a product 
that is demanded by customers at as low a price as possible while covering all the costs that are in internalized by the firm. Right, where those costs would include any costs of managing the contracts among the, the different parties to the firm. Right, in its very simplest form, that organizational structure is, gonna, is going to define two primary things. One is the nature of the payoffs. Right, who gets what? And when do they get it? And secondly, the, what is going to be the decision-making process within the firm? Who gets to decide what are the operational decisions of, of the firm? And again, this is all falling out of, the, of an endogenous process that tries to pull all these, these different parties to contracts together in a way that is most efficient to deliver this, this product at the minimum cost that's going to allow this organization to be competitive in, in, a, in a competitive world. Right? Now, how does this somehow lead us to shareholder primacy in, in, in the first place? Well, the, the, the first step, I think, is to recognize that when you think about a particular organization, a, a corporation, you're talking about an entity that has many different stakeholders, customers, suppliers, creditors, communities, labor, um, all these different parties to, to what we call the firm, right? And if we, if we think of that sort of structure in the context of a, a traditional Coase theorem sort of approach, right, what Coase theorem would say is that the optimal decision rule is to sort of take a stakeholder sort of approach to, to sort of maximize the combined welfare of all these stakeholders and then just use contracts right, to efficiently allocate the resulting wealth among these, these different stakeholders. Right? And the way in which the Coase theorem is ultimately going to work in an efficient sense is if these contracts are costless to write. Right? But, of course, they're not <laughs> costless to write. They're not costless to enforce. And what's particularly important, I think, in the, in the context of a corporation is that all these different stakeholders have potentially wildly different preferences with respect to the actual decisions that a company would undertake and the resulting uh, payoffs that might be generated and the, and the riskiness of those payoffs that might be generated through, through this process. So arguably then it's, it's, it's exceedingly costly to try to write contracts that are going to meet a variety of these, uh, of, of these different stakeholder preferences. Right? So what results in this in this endogenous optimization optimization process is the corporate organizational form that that tends to have these particular characteristics. So most of these different factors of production have contracts that have sort of a, mostly a fixed payoff kind of structure, like you see with with a with a labor contract or a. a or a fixed uh, creditor sort of, of contract. They might have some incentive payoffs, but those incentive payoffs tend to be tied to, to very specific uh, performance measures. Now, to say that these are fixed payoffs does not at all imply that they're riskless payoffs. Right? They're risky payoffs for, for each of these parties, and that risk is going to depend on the priority structure of these payoffs, who, who gets paid first, and so, and, and so on. All right, but these contracts all have prices associated with them, and those prices are going to reflect that, that particular risk. All right, there's going to be some residual risk then that is borne by one set of, of agents, which in this case is, is the shareholders who have contracted for the rights to what, what we tend to call in finance the net cash flows, what, what cash flows are left over after the other various factors of production have, have been paid. All right. So what that, so that sort of specifies the payoff structure. The decision rights then are vested in this set of agents, the shareholders, right, who are the residual claimants. All right. Now, again, it's, I think it's important to point out that, that this is the result of, of an optimization process in, in a presumably competitive type, type of market. There's nothing that, that says you have to be organized this way, right? but corporations are 
organized this this way. So it is a competitive solution of trying to trying to maximize the stakeholder welfare overall, right? At, in a way that minimizes the the various contracting costs uh, that are associated with with doing so, right? So it, it clearly doesn't say that these stakeholders are being ignored in any way. In fact, they're contracting right up front through the through the price pricing structure that they've they've agreed to. Right? Now, why do we think this is efficient? Well. My short answer would always be, well, it's the outcome of a competitive process. It must be efficient if that's the case. But I think there's reasonable economic arguments, too, for, for why we would think this would be an efficient structure. One, argue, one argument is that, well, we're, we're allowing for some specialization and risk bearing in a set of, 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 of agents, in this case, the shareholders, who aren't also making organization-specific investments like, like an employee might or a supplier might. Right? So it allows for that specialization that you know, arguably is, is, is going to be efficient. In some ways, more importantly, I think um, this, allows, this allows for the objective function of the, of, of the company and meeting and demand of the customer to be done in a way that limits the contracting costs. Right? By limiting the risks to these other agents besides the residual claimants, the cost of monitoring and adjusting other contracts for for changing risks or changing dynamics within within the firm are are, are reduced, right? And then third, right, this is likely to to contribute to the survival of the organization because by limiting these contracting costs, not only is that good for the the the, the holders of the rights to the net cash flows. Right, but it's going to allow the company to deliver its product at a lower price and therefore be more competitive in the marketplace and, and therefore survive at a higher rate than companies that were organized in a different way that, that involves higher contracting costs. All right, so that's sort of a, a, a quick summary, my quickest summary of how we got to shareholder primacy in the first place. So I think then the question is, well, if we have evolved to a situation like we're in today in which there is increased demand for, for CSR, should that change anything about the, that logic that led us to shareholder primacy in, in the first place? And so to get at that, I think it's, it's worthwhile to at least think about the different possible effects uh, that various CSR policies might have, right? You can think of certain policies uh, that fall under the CSR umbrella uh, that would increase the present value of the net cash flows. So increase what's, what's available to the shareholders. And one example might be some sustainable production processes like, you know, free range chickens, uh, for which there's increased con consumer demand. Consumers offer a price premium on that. If that price premium exceeds the marginal costs of, of, of providing that sustainable production process, then it is in the interest of, of the shareholders too to, to go ahead and, and adopt that policy. So that's one type of, of policy, right? Another type of CSR policy might decrease the present value of net cash flows, right? but also fail to increase the welfare of, of any other stakeholders. And some, some people have argued that uh, some of the, the proposals that the SEC have made with respect to climate disclosure sorts of, uh, uh, sorts of rules would fall into that category, in which you're imposing some costs on shareholders, and it's not actually producing a benefit in terms of, of climate change. So other stakeholders are not benefited from that. So if that's what's going on, that would fall into this category, not number two. All right. And the third category, which is arguably the most interesting in all in all this debate, are policies that would it, would decrease the net cash flows to 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 the shareholders, but they might increase the the welfare of at least some of the stakeholders. So there's some trade-off uh, that's involved, and somebody's going to have to make that choice somewhere. All right. So those those are sort of the three main categories of, of interest that I think you want to ask, well, if we were to move away from shareholder primacy, are we likely to be to adopting an objective function that does a better job of sorting among those the, those different uh, policies? Right. But the problem here, I, the way I'm thinking about this, 
is that just like it's the case that various stakeholders have very differences, very different preferences with respect to day-to-day -day operating policies of, of the firm, that's likely to be true with respect to any CSR policies as, as well. Right. So whatever whatever problems we saw in, in terms of uh, exacerbating contracting costs by trying to adopt contracts that meet the preferences of all our stakeholders, those are even greater if we add on top of that different preferences with respect to to, to CSR policies. Right. So on that basis, it seems likely that the efficient organizational structure is still likely to involve shareholders as as a residual claimant are receiving these net cash flows, which would then lead us to to a shareholder primacy sort of uh, approach to this. Now, I think what's important to point out here, though, is that that does not mean that the stakeholder preferences or this increased demand for CSR is going to be ignored. Right? In fact, it shouldn't be at all because this increased demand should be embedded in these fixed payoffs or the prices that the various stakeholders are are agreeing to when contracting with, with the firm. Right? So what I mean by that and the basic idea here is that the stakeholder demands for CSR are going to be re reflected in what I'll call state contingent contract prices. Right? Where the state here is, is the fulfillment or not of, of the demand for, for, for CSR. All right, so we can think this through in terms of the various uh, stakeholders to, to the firm, customers. We talked about this one already. Customers may, in fact, be willing to offer a price premium for companies with more uh, socially responsible policies. Right, if that price premium is big enough, that CSR demand is, is met by the firm. Employees uh, may demand a wage premium in companies that they view as being less socially responsible suppliers are going to define the terms of the of of their agreement on the basis of their their view of the company's csr policies communities are going to uh, make their any subsidies to corporations within the community contingent on uh, on the supply of of socially responsible policies. Shareholders might be willing to accept lower returns in exchange for certain uh, CSR policies. And I know lots of people, some in the room have done some work on that already. And so the idea here is that under a shareholder primacy organizational type of, of, of form, firms are gonna supply CSR to the extent that the costs of doing so uh, are are lower um, than than the benefits of doing so, where the benefits are are the adjustment in these contract prices that they have with with the different uh, different stakeholders. Right. Now, you could uh, you may be sitting there thinking this already. You say, well, a lot of these things are not actually internalized by the firm. Uh, that the, that we're really talking a lot about a lot of things that are, are externalities. Now, again, as economists, we would think, well, it's not really the most efficient way to to address these extern externalities by doing so within the within the organizational structure of the firm. It really should be on institutions like government regulators who who are in a best position to to address those those externalities, right? But we might be in this position already, right, because in this position being an increased demand for, for a CSR, because there is this view that governments are, are not uh, doing a very good job of addressing those externalities. So what if that's the case? Right? Should that push us towards more of a stakeholder primacy point of view? Well, here um, it's difficult for me to see how a stakeholder primacy type of approach would do a better job at that because like the shareholders, other stakeholders that are within the firm may in fact have very different preferences with respect to those CSR policies relative to what you know, we might view as what's best for society. Right? So it's, it's not at all clear that taking a stakeholder approach is really gonna get us anything there. That's not to say that the shareholder primacy view is going to necessarily then 
provide the socially optimal amount of CSR policy. It's just saying that they're just as likely to do so as a, as a, as a stakeholder uh, type of approach without some of the additional costs that might come with, uh, with the stakeholder approach. Right. So uh, another possibility then would be, well, okay, if, if we can't count on, uh, on uh, government regulators and other institutions to handle this, maybe what we ought to do, and a lot of people call for this, I think, is to essentially delegate this role to corporate executives and sort of make the, the CEO, in a, in a sense, uh, a CSR central planner. Right. Again here, I, I have to express some skepticism that, that CEOs could, could could really do this because what we're really be, be saying then is that this problem is is really too complex and too costly for voluntary contracts to sort out, right? But yet we expect this is one individual or a small set of of individuals within the firm uh, to do an effective job of 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 managing this this central planning uh, uh, sort of exercise. It's not all obvious that. That the top executives have what you think is the specialized expertise that would be required to do this. They are hired to do a certain thing, which is to meet this customer demand at, at effective prices. And now we'd be asking them to do something that's much broader than that and to manage the trade offs that would exist among the different stakeholders if you're talking about CSR policies that fall into that bin number three that I was talking about, where it might decrease present values of, of net cash flows to shareholders, but benefit some stakeholders, but not all stakeholders. All right, those are tough decisions to, to make, and we'd be, we'd be delegating this to, to corporate managers who really don't have any specialized expertise in that. And then I think what that, what that causes is potentially a much greater agency problem than, than we already have. So if we, if we think of residual agency costs within the firm, as being a result of, of, of sort of this opaque decision-making structure in which there is some specialized expertise in, in, in the hands of the managers that outsiders like shareholders don't have as good of information. So it's difficult to monitor managerial behavior as a result of that opacity. Well, that opacity is much, much greater now if, if we're saying, well, in addition to making decisions that, that maximize the net cash flows, present value in a present value sense, right? we want you to do this too. We want you to manage these trade-offs among stakeholders with respect to, to CSR. Right? That would seem like it would be creating potentially very large uh, agency costs that are much, much more difficult uh, to monitor. All right, so, so that's the sense in which ultimately it, it, it doesn't seem like this increase in demand for CSR should really lead us to a different objective function, but rather let that objective function of shareholder primacy uh, within the confines of that, right, these, these, uh, these demands can be met, maybe not fully, but they can be met as efficiently as, as, as any other uh, structure. All right, so... Uh, let me try to finish up with 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 a, just a few thoughts then about what this means in terms of of doing research in this area. And, and and when I say research in this area, I'm really narrowing it down to you know this this framework of organizational structure and its impact on sustainability. There's many more aspects to sustainability research than 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 just these. Right? But if you think about this framework by itself. I, I, I think the general idea here is that the, the supply of CSR is then going to be endogenous. Is that companies that, that supply the CSR will be those that can do so at the lowest price. Right? There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all CSR sort of approach. There's a certain amount of demand for CSR. That's going to be met by those parties that can provide that CSR at the lowest price. So sustainable farming would be a good example of that. I mean, it doesn't mean that all farms should be farming in exactly the same way. There's some demand for a certain amount of sustainability that's met by companies that can provide that at, at the lowest price. Others don't. And they're all, all these companies are optimizing in that sense. So what this means, I think, in terms of research is that 
it's probably not as fruitful to be thinking in terms of, well, how does CSR impact value in a, in a cross-sectional sort of sense? And that, uh, that's the parallel that I would draw with you know, traditional corporate governance research, where for a long time we thought, well, what's the optimal governance structure? Are companies better off, for example, with more outside directors? And so you see a lot of tests that relate corporate value to the proportion of outside directors, and you don't find all that much, but I don't think you'd expect to find very much, right? because this is an endogenous selection process. And uh, if companies are all optimizing, then you don't really find anything in terms of the cross-section of value uh, against the selection of, of, of these policies. It seems a lot more fruitful to be thinking in terms of what drives the cross-section of these choices. Right? Why do some firms provide certain CSR policies while other firms do not? Is that because of the cost structure providing it? Is it differences in, in agency problems across these different organizations? I, I think it's useful to think in terms of the tests of, uh, of, of the impact on the various stakeholder prices, right? To what extent are there wage premiums, for example, based on observed CSR policies? To what extent are there consumer price premiums? To what extent do shareholder, are shareholders willing to accept lower returns? And we've certainly seen some of that research already. And to me, that, that seems a very, uh, very useful thing to do. All right. This seems like an area that's very ripe for work in the in the field of shareholder activism. Right? To to when when does this take place? When do activists try to pursue CSR policies? When is it effective for them to do so? How do they do so? Is it different from the other type of shareholder activism that we see? Right? Can we link various proxies for agency costs like we have in other parts of corporate finance? Right? Do we see those being having predictive power? for the choice of, of CSR policies. That seems fairly fruitful. Um, I think we started to see some research in the area of C CEO incentive contracts. All right, to what extent are CEO contracts written in a way that try to promote certain CSR policies? Right? Which firms do that sort of thing? When you see it, what sort of trade-offs are implied by the magnitudes of the incentives for CSR versus the magnitude of incentives for maximizing uh, the, the stock price. All right, these are all things that, that seem like uh, useful approaches to me that come directly out of thinking about this, this framework of, of, of firms optimizing their organizational structure uh, and therefore pursuing a, a, a shareholder primacy sort of approach. Okay, I think I'm, I'm getting short on time. So uh, let me just try to quickly quickly summarize what, what I think the main takeaways from, from this are. I think, well, again, unquestionably, there is this increased attention and demand for, for CSR uh, policies within companies. Um, I think the main point is that this demand can be met and is met even under a shareholder primacy sort of approach. Right. It could also be met with a, with a stakeholder primacy type of approach, right? but it seems likely to me that that approach is going to engender much higher costs in the form of contracting costs and potential agency costs than what you would see under a shareholder primacy approach. All right. Where does that leave us in terms of research? I think the research uh, can be very, very useful in contributing to our understanding of not only how do CSR preferences impact uh, the various contracts within the firm, right, but also how firms tend to choose among the different set of, of CSR sort of policies. Right, so I'll stop there, and I guess uh, we may have time for some questions. Is that right? Testing. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, right on time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have five uh, minutes. Uh, we will have, you know, two helper with the uh, mic. Mic. So, anyone have a question for David? Yes, Cindy. Cindy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. This was uh, was very interesting, and I agree with the fact that 
it's unclear if we think about this um, externalities being being integrated into the firm that you know which primary sort of model we, we should we should choose. But I think there's sort of a, a different discussion, which is sort of starting with with Friedman is should firms um, you know look at other uh, other things than than shareholder value, right? So this is sort of conditional on shareholder primacy, right? So that's sort of accepted. But now that shareholders have different preferences, apparently, now we deviate from profit maximization or shareholder value maximization, and we go to shareholder welfare maximization. So mm-hmm. the hard and the garless argument. So I wonder, I think this is sort of different to what you've been talking about. So I wonder what your view is on this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting, interesting question. I think it's a particularly difficult one, though, to manage w- within the firm because – you, know, you think of the, the, a typical corporation, anyway, that that is widely held, uh, has shares that are very liquid, and so you have potentially a, a shareholder base that is constantly changing. To define what that shareholder welfare is, or shareholder welfare preferences, is extremely difficult. And I think that you're running into the same sort of contracting costs that you would come. Uh, with in terms of a stakeholder approach, we have different stakeholders with different preferences. Shareholders are going to have very different preferences here. And where where we got to shareholder value as being uh, being the objective function comes mostly from the fact that well, that's one dimension on which most rational economic agents can agree is that more value is better than less, and less volatility of that value is better than more volatility. Um, so it's a, it's a very well-defined objective function. Uh, so to me, it seems like that's probably still the most efficient way to go and that to try to introduce these uh, additional dimensions of shareholder welfare is going to be difficult other than through the prices themselves. You know, shareholders you know, certainly have the ability to, to influence the, the price of those shares uh, in that that's going to influence the, the corporate policies through that dimension. But other than that, I think it's going to be very costly to try to, to, to for, for the company to do something like, uh, uh, who was, I think, Hart and Zingali sort of have argued that, you know, maybe you sort of poll the shareholders for what they want. Well, sure, you could do that, but I'm a little skeptical that that, that can be managed in a, in a way that's, that's not extremely costly. Okay, I'll take one more question. Um, they have a lady at the back. Yeah, hey, David. Uh, uh, again, you know, very interesting talk. You listed that uh, uh, for negative value, like MPF has negative value, give example for SEC disclosure. And uh, as like uh, a lot of people now, like working on the ESG so-called reporting, and so can you kind of elaborate in your mind that that is actually like negative? Oh, you know, I'm, I was simply using that as a hypothetical. Some people would view that as a negative. Other people do not. Um, uh, the, the sense in which it, it could be a negative is if this is a disclosure rule that by, by its very name, any disclosure rule is going to impose some additional costs on the companies providing that disclosure. If it doesn't also produce a benefit, um, for for shareholders, then it, it, it's in the end a, a negative MPV. So the example I was giving it, it would be a situation in which you mandate this disclosure, but in providing that disclosure, nothing has changed about uh, the socially responsible policies themselves or the impact ultimately on something like climate change. If that's true, it would fall into that category of, of number two. I'm not arguing that it is true or isn't true. Um, but but that would be the type of of uh, decision that would fall into that category. But I think from a standpoint of you know accounting scholar like like yourself and others that you know, that's the way you want to be thinking about this is that, you know what what is the what's the social trade off that's involved in these in these disclosure policies that are being discussed. Um, thank you, David. Uh, for the time, for the time's sake, you know, um, we have to um, uh, let give a big hand of our applause for uh, David for his thanks. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank, thank you, John.